Welcome to the uh, first service bus talk of TechEd Europe. Uh, this talk is going to be dedicated to some of the use cases for the Windows Azure service bus and also the service bus for Windows Server, uh, particularly around connected clients. So I hope that's what you all came expecting to hear. Uh, my name is Todd Holmquist Sutherland. I'm the Group Program Manager for the Windows Azure Service Bus. I've been doing that since uh, 2009. So I've been here through um, the, the, most of the evolution of the uh, Azure Service Bus. I've also got with me today, uh, helping me with the demo, Afan Dar, who's sitting here in the front row. Uh, Afan is a principal dev on our team. And uh, Clemens Vasters is hiding out in the back of the room there. So uh, all three of us are here if, uh, in the course of the talk, questions come up, uh, please raise your hand. I'll do my best to address them. We do have a lot of material to cover, so if we don't get to everything, um, no worries. Uh, Clemens and Afan and I will all be here right after the talk, as well as at the uh, Ask the Experts session this evening from 6 to 8 at the Azure table. You can find us if you have more, uh, more questions or things you want to talk to us about. Okay. So I'm going to start with a really brief overview of some of the core use cases that we've seen for a long time and that we've really focused on uh, with the service bus. The first one is what we call core messaging. And for core messaging, we generally have um, customers using our queues and topics, which is our PubSub infrastructure in the service bus. And among the various uh, benefits that we see customers getting out of using queues and topics, one of the key is scaling out their applications. So if you imagine that you have a couple of different roles in your application, say a web role and a worker role uh, hosted in the Azure cloud, you can use a queue or a topic between those roles to enable those roles to scale independently. So effectively what this does is it provides some buffering between those roles, so that if you have a web role that's pushing messages very quickly, more quickly than your back-end worker role can actually handle, that queue or that topic can effectively serve as a buffer and uh, allow a, a decoupled architecture. And that lets you scale out that back-end role in a very nice way, independently of the front-end role. That also provides some amount of resiliency. So if your back-end role goes offline, uh, for a period of time, those messages aren't going to be lost. They're going to pile up in the queue or the topic. So the decoupling benefit is not just for scale, but also for resiliency. And then we support a variety of more complex patterns using a feature set that we have built into the queues and topics, which is very, very rich. So uh, I'm, I'm not going to go through all of the features here, but just to give a flavor. And again, I think most of you probably have this background already, but just to give a flavor of some of the things that we do that are um, supporting these more advanced or complex messaging patterns, we have features like durability. So obviously, if we have a buffered uh, messaging solution, um, we have the ability to store those messages while they're in flight in a durable manner. Um, we have the ability to do pub-sub patterns using the topic so that you can actually do anything from one-to-one -one type messaging versus, uh, or one-to-n, so fanning out messages to multiple recipients. And then you can apply filters to topics that let you set rules that determine which subscriptions get which messages. So a, a true pub-sub system. We also have something called sessions that let you store a little bit of state on each subscription or each queue. And that allows some very advanced scenarios where you can actually make your own code less stateful by relying on the service bus to keep track of, for example, where you are in the process of dealing with a stream of messages that go together in some way that need to be processed as a group. I'm going to talk a little bit about that uh, a little later. We also have features like deduplication. So we will keep a buffer of message IDs that you've sent us within some time window. And if we see another ID of the same value come through, we can suppress that message to help you with uh, avoiding duplicate message delivery. We have transactional support. We have batching. Uh, we have the ability to do scheduled messaging so that you can pick an, a delivery time. And only when that delivery time uh, arrives does the system push the message into the queue or the topic for processing. We have something called auto-forwarding, where you can take queues and topics and knit them together or compose them so that messages can be automatically forward, say, 
forwarded from a subscription on a topic into another entity like a queue. And I'm going to talk a little bit about a scenario for using that in the context of connected client today. And there's many, many more. Uh, the service bus queue and topic capability has been out for over two years now. And so over that two-year period, we've really just continually been adding more and more features to the list. It's a very long list. Um, you can find uh, pretty solid, complete documentation on MSDN for all of those features. So if you're interested or have more questions, one thing you could do is attend Clemens' talk tomorrow. He's going to walk through a number of those uh, features in detail. So I just talked about uh, core messaging, which again is using cues and topics to decouple the roles of your application. So within the boundary of a single application, making those different roles scalable and resilient relative to one another. The other major scenario that we see people using Service Bus for is what I'm calling hybrid services. And by hybrid services, what I mean is the idea that you have components of your app that are running in locations other than the cloud, which you may or may not control. You may or may not have access to those networks. You may or may not be able to make any changes to give you access to those networks. They may be customer networks, customer locations. They may be your own location, but you may have a very strict, it may be your own data center, but you might have very strict corporate firewall policies. So for that, you need what we call location transparency. You need the ability to send a message to a component without necessarily knowing uh, the IP address of that component or being able to di directly address it using IP. So that's what we call location transparency and kind of goes hand in hand with firewall and NAT traversal. So imagine you've got that same application that I just showed, that kind of really simple app with a couple of roles running in the Azure cloud. Now you've got some on-prem resources. Those can be services living on premises. Those can be data, uh, data sources that are on-premises. You can effectively use Service Bus to connect those cloud-hosted services back into those on-premise resources. And we have a couple of different ways of doing that. So I've, I've, I've shown both the relay as well as queues and topics here. The relay is another feature of Service Bus uh, in addition to the core pub-sub messaging capability of queues and topics. We have a service relay, and the service relay lets you take services written in WCF, Windows Communication Framework, and project those services out into the cloud so that they can be discovered and interacted with by your applications as if they were local to those applications. So that's one way of achieving the uh, hybrid services type scenario. The other way is to use queues and topics. It's a little bit more complicated because if you're doing a service invocation over something like a queue or a topic, that's going to need a back channel. It's going to need a way to take the response from that service call and get it back to the calling service. So to do that over queues and topics, you need to develop or to build a correlated messaging pattern, usually involving more than one queue or topic, where you have a queue or topic that's actually used to make the service call down into the on-premise assets as well as a set of cues or topics that are used to return the response back to the calling service. And then you need to do correlation across those two. So it's a little bit more complicated. We've got some materials online that um, talk about how you would do that. And we have many customers who do that. The benefit of that is that it gives you an added level of durability or the ability to ensure delivery of those messages. It also gives you that decoupling capability. With a relay, you have direct synchronous access to the service. So that's the trade-off between Relay and Cues and Topics for this hybrid services scenario. But both work quite well, and we have a number of customers doing both today. Um, we also have, uh, as a result of the, the, the buffering in Cues and Topics, we, we support um, or we provide support for scaling out that back end, whether it's living on premises or in some other uh, data center. Again, that kind of decoupling lets you separately scale the roles. But also, the Service Bus Relay has a capability for uh, attaching multiple listeners to the same relay endpoint. We call that load balancing. So you can take a service, 
you can run it in a scaled out fashion on the back end and have multiple instances of that service connecting to the same service bus relay endpoint. And as clients come in and make calls against that endpoint, we will automatically load balance and pin those calls or those client sessions to individual back end instances of your service. So that provides a, we do that in a round robin fashion. So that provides a level of scalability uh, and, and also resiliency that's important to know about. Some people aren't aware that we've done that actually. For the first year that we had Relay out, it was our number one feature ask and we just, we just took us a long time to get to it and we finally did. And then uh, uh, since then, I, I don't know if people have really registered that this capability exists, but it's really important for the Relay. Uh, so I talked about resiliency. Another benefit of the Relay in the case of hybrid services is that we have a sort of turnkey or super easy configuration driven ability to take services and, pr and project them out into the cloud. And that's really today, uh, that is something that you can do by virtue of our integration with WCF. So if you have WCF based services, uh, you can simply plug in a new configuration. Uh, it's actually a binding that you would change you would swap in one of the service bus relay bindings for an existing WCF binding. And we have service bus versions of all of the common WCF bindings. And by swapping in that new, uh, that new binding, then automatically under the hood, our client software will do the magic of authorizing that service to connect into that, the cloud, as well as uh, maintaining that connection out to the cloud for you and reestablishing it if it gets broken and all of that stuff. So that's what we do in our Relay client. Uh, so I'm calling that turnkey Cloud Connect. Now, we are also doing a bunch of work in the coming year to make that even simpler and to extend it beyond WCF. I'm going to leave it at that for right now, but you can expect in uh, future sessions uh, coming up in the, in the fall or the winter to start hearing from us about uh, some, a much more uh, even much more turnkey experience than this for um, remoting on-prem services. And then uh, cues and topics just give the, the benefits I've already described, which we sometimes talk about as brokered messaging. Okay, so those are the two most common scenarios that customers have been using Service Bus for um, over the last few years. But we also have customers using us for a third major scenario that we talk about as connected clients. So in both of those cases that I just described, Service Bus is providing effectively message level integration between services or between roles of your application. The difference with connected client is you're actually talking about components that are either providing user interface or that are broadly distributed and providing kind of the endpoints out in the world for your application. So when I'm talking about connected client, I'm thinking about scenarios like mobile workforce, which we're seeing a lot more applications addressing uh, because employees are using mobile devices and the bring your own device phenomenon is driving the need to do that in a way that's cross-platform. So when we were just thinking about service to service messaging, uh, we didn't have to think as much or as there weren't as many complexities around supporting multiple platforms as there are when you're talking about the whole huge diverse range of client platforms that exist out there in the world for mobile. So that's a special set of challenges that we've thought a lot about in Service Bus and you're going to see some, some things today that, that, uh, that relate to what, what we're doing to address that. And then another big uh, driver for uh, the connected client scenario is what's called machine to machine or M2M. Um, also known as uh, the Internet of Things. And we tend to define this as being about special purpose devices. So whereas the other types of clients that we talk about, including um, smartphones, are general purpose computing devices, the Internet of Things tends to involve devices that have a very, very specific purpose. Even a very powerful platform like, like the compute platform or the infotainment system in an automobile is nevertheless, in many cases, specialized. It's very specialized for a set of functions that are specific to that device, the automobile, and the infotainment systems in an automobile. So we call those special purpose devices. And the, the, what, what we're seeing is just an explosion in the number of special purpose devices that applications need to interact with. Uh, 
And that type of scenario is gaining traction across a number of different inter industries. So just to give a couple examples where we've seen, uh, we've seen a lot of activity. Um, one is industrial machinery, uh, what's known as remote servicing, the ability to get some sort of diagnostics on a piece of equipment that you've sold and to do that remotely. Uh, that's becoming almost a, a baseline requirement for equipment manufacturers when the equipment has a certain value. So people who are building machines or equipment that you know, is worth some amount of money, where the maintenance over time can actually be a high cost, are, are starting to see the need to have this kind of remote diagnostics as a baseline customer expectation for that sort of equipment. So that's gone well beyond the sort of the hype phase of the Internet of Things, and it's, it's here today, and it's actually become um, very common. Another one is uh, building automation. Uh, things like companies that provide services inside of buildings to do the automation of the various si systems in a big building are starting to move into services. So they're starting to offer cloud-based services that can provide different types of analytics, such as giving feedback to their customers about how to better manage and control uh, energy utilization in their buildings, or about security risks that might exist. And these value-added services become sources of subscription revenue for, um, for building automation providers. So the Internet of Things is really changing that business dramatically. And then another one that uh, some of you may have heard about is that uh, there are insurance companies now offering special rates or special policy terms to customers who are willing to let the insurance company monitor how they drive. Um, that might sound a little scary, uh, but, but you know, if, if, uh, if, you're, if you're really cost conscious and you're a safe driver, then you know, why not let the insurance company have some view into how you're driving and get a break on your, uh, on your auto insurance as a result. So this is just a few examples to kind of set up the, the, the Internet of Things. But so I think the combination of, work, of mobile workforce and the Internet of Things is really driving this explosion of what we're calling connected clients. Uh, and of course, all of these clients need to be backed by some kind of services, typically running in the cloud. So now, we've seen customers coming to us with these types of scenarios for a couple of years, and it's really started to pick up in the last year. And as the, through the course of working with those customers, we've learned what are some of the common challenges that are specific to messaging in that scenario. And so this talk is really going to be about walking through each of the major areas where you know, we, we've seen a challenge and then we've done some work or where we have some existing features that by teaching customers how to use them for these scenarios, uh, we're able to really solve an important problem in this space. So there's four that I want to call out. User engagement. This mostly comes into play with uh, devices that have a UI, such as a mobile phone or a tablet. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about why user engagement is a special problem there in a minute. Again, the problem of location transparency or addressability. It is the same kind of problem that we saw in the enterprise space with the first two scenarios, but it has some different characteristics when you're talking about connected devices, especially around scale. Client platform diversity, I mentioned that already. And then the fourth and final one I'm going to talk about today is how to choose the right auth model. And I'm going to go into a little bit what I mean by auth when I get to that section. There are many other messaging challenges that I could have put in this deck, but these are four that we have uh, a, a lot of um, capabilities around and where I thought it would be useful to cover today. Any questions so far? Okay, good. Good question. So the question is, is the relay server in Microsoft's infrastructure, or is that something that anyone could run in their own infrastructure? The answer is that it's currently only offered as part of the Windows Azure public cloud platform. Um, we have had some customers wanting to see us deliver that as part of the service bus server that we released last fall, uh, but it's been very, very low interest relative to 
cues and topics. So we haven't focused on that yet, but it is on our radar. And uh, if you have a scenario for that, I'd love to talk to you afterwards and learn more about what's driving the interest in that. Uh, OK, so user engagement. What do I mean by user engagement? Really what I mean is push notifications. That's the solution to user engagement. But let me talk about why that's important, why that's especially important in connected client. One is that we have these rich UI experiences that we're now enabling through things like Windows Store apps and the rich live tile experience that that, that gives customers. So we want to make it possible for people to build Windows Store apps that are truly engaging, that have a lot of information that is relevant to the user in the context where the user finds themselves. So that experience is going to require us to deliver real-time notifications out to those connected clients to make sure that those live tiles have current information. So this could be something like showing a map of your drive home with the traffic displayed on the tile for the navigation app that you have. I use that one all the time, actually. You know, I, I'm always looking at that tile on my Windows phone just before I go home to see what the traffic looks like. I don't have to open the app anymore. It's right there on the tile. So that, that provides this really nice engaging experience and pulls people into the app. Uh, alerting, so getting the user's attention when they're not, when they're not watching, um, but at least letting them see, hey, there's something here that's changed. Maybe there's a news update or maybe a customer engagement, a customer opportunity has just developed, and a salesperson uh, can look at their phone and just immediately see through a toast message, hey, there's, there's something that's just happened with an account that you're working on. So you, know, you might want to open the app and figure out what that is and then decide what action to take. So that's kind of engaging the user. And displaying a badge would be another way, where you, know, you have a number on the badge that actually indicates how many messages are waiting or some other statistic. So this is kind of user engagement, and it's something that is really important for connected clients with a UI. It also has some special challenges around it. So some of those are the number of platforms. So we have Windows Store, we have iOS, Android, Windows Phone, even BlackBerry. And every one of those platforms has different capabilities to support push notifications. Uh, they're starting to converge on some common patterns, but there's still a lot of differences. And then the other piece that's really challenging is just scale. So how do you build out a back-end messaging infrastructure that can handle potentially very, very large device populations? We have customers today who are using um, hundreds of thousands and projecting to go to many millions of connected devices. And that starts to pose some challenges around how you, um, how, how you manage that. Um, there are different types of connectivity, and depending on the type of connectivity, uh, that, can, that can really become a demanding resource drain on your server infrastructure. So then there's things like storing and maintaining device registrations and dealing with all of those protocols that the different uh, notification services provide. So these are the common challenges for engaging users. The answer to that um, that we've come up with is a new thing in Service Bus a new entity in Service Bus that we're calling Notification Hubs. So the Notification Hub is a thing just like a topic or a queue or a relay that you can go and create within your Service Bus namespace. And it will encapsulate a set of functionality that you can control programmatically uh, as well as through the portal. So I'm going to walk through this. We've actually had Notification Hubs out in preview since January. How many people have actually seen or played with the notification hubs already? Not very many. OK. Uh, well, we thought, we thought that might be the case because we haven't spoken about notification hubs at any major event we, yet. We, um, we released the preview in January. We're going to go um, to general availability this summer. Um, so we thought this would be a good occasion to sort of go through that in some detail. And actually, the, I've got a lot of material in here on notification hubs uh, to just kind of present that feature. Uh, end to end, and, um, and we're also going to have a demo. So let me first walk through what are the specific challenges that notification hubs are addressing. And it's going to be a bit of a repeat of some of the things I said, but I'm going to try to drill in a little bit more. Um, I want to first walk through how an application registers, how a mobile application registers to receive push notifications. This is, this is not specific to notification hubs yet. What I'm talking about here is true across 
any app that you're writing for mobile that receives push notifications in this way. Uh, so you have a client app, and the client app wants to receive notifications. So what it does is it reaches out to a service that's provided by the OS vendor. So Apple has its own push notification service. Windows has its own push notification service. Actually, at Microsoft, we have two of them, one for phone and one for Windows 8. Um, and Google has its own notification service and so forth and so on. So these are services that are maintained by the OS vendors, and they support pushing notifications down to the mobile device. But you need to first register your client application with that push notification service so that it knows that you're, you know, how, to, how to reach you. It actually can assign you an address effectively. You need to do that, and you need to do that frequently. So client apps need to constantly go and call back to the push notification service and say, I'm alive, here I am. Uh, can you tell me again what my address is? So the client is constantly refreshing its address or its registration with the push notification service. And then what the client does is it gives that address or that handle to any back-end system that is going to need to reach it, that is going to need to push notifications to it. So there's a two-step process. Register with the PNS, give your handle to a back-end system that can then reach you using that handle. So that's the normal approach. <coughs> <clears throat> so then what happens is the back-end system can use that handle to push a notification to you through the PNS. <clears throat> Notice that one of the things that has to happen here is that when the PNS doesn't find the client that you thought you wanted to push to, the PNS needs to tell the app back-end, hey, I couldn't deliver this thing. Here's a, this address that you gave me isn't real or isn't, isn't known to me anymore, or I've blacklisted it for some reason. <clears throat> what that means is that your back end has to keep track of all that, has to know the state of the, current, of the registrations of all of those client apps. And that in and of itself is a pretty heavy uh, load. Um, there's a lot of traffic generated, and then you have to build out the infrastructure to manage all of that uh, state. <clears throat> Excuse me. So there are different uh, communication protocols with every one of these PNSs. Uh, some of them use HTTP, some use TCP. They all have their own higher level uh, API. Uh, they use different message formats. And uh, in terms of what you can actually do through them, the kinds of notifications you can send, and I've already mentioned with Live Tile, we have something very special in the Windows 8 platform. Uh, but with, uh, with Apple, there are certain things you can do. With, with Google um, uh, and Android, there are certain things you can do. These things all differ. So the push notification actually, the push notification service allows you to send a single message to a single device. To be more specific, it allows you to send a single message to a specific application on that device. To be more specific, it allows you to send a single message to a specific channel on a specific application on a specific device. So it's very, very targeted, and you need to know what it is that you're targeting. You might have an application that is listening for a few different types of notifications. And depending on the type of notification, it may present the notification differently. Your backend needs to know all of that with the current push notification infrastructure that exists out there in the world today. So you may have a complicated case logic that you need to implement in your back-end code to say, well, under these circumstances, I want to use this particular channel. And under those circumstances, I want to use that particular channel. And all of that logic is on your app. And I already mentioned about maintaining the registrations. That's the third point here. That actually inv involves quite a bit of... Uh, uh, um, architectural focus on scale. So I think I've already talked, to about, uh, talked about all of these points. Now I want to talk about what Notification Hubs does. So what you do with Notification Hubs is that you go into the service bus and you provision a Notification Hub, just as today you go in and you provision a queue or you provision a topic. It's a thing in the service bus that you create. This Notification Hub is going to store a set of credentials that you have obtained from 
each of the push notification services that you use. Those credentials basically let your back end communicate with the PNS. You, you had to do that anyway in the, old, in the old model. Now you're going to give those credentials over to the notification hub. You're going to configure those credentials um, into your notification hub when you set it up. Next, when client apps register with the PNS, when they're refreshing their address or their handle, rather than giving that address or handle to your back end, the clients are going to start giving that registration uh, handle to the notification hub. So we're going to keep track of all of those registrations. And as they're constantly changing throughout the day, if you have millions of clients or even, even thousands of clients, the amount of traffic that can be generated by refreshing or updating registrations can be quite large. Actually, when we built the push notification service, we were trying to figure out what was going to drive our costs for the service. And we quickly figured out that the amount of traffic just from the registration process was going to dwarf or be much larger than the traffic from the actual notifications. So this is a big job, and we take that off of your hands. Once we've got that uh, registration, now we know how to, uh, how to reach the, the, the end client. So when you want to send a notification to those clients, rather than sending it directly to the PNS and having to figure out which PNS to send it to, you just send it to us. And we will take care of then delivering that notification into, into any and all of the PNSs that you want to interface with. Make sense? All right, so now it's, uh, it's a Fon's turn to come up and show you what that actually looks like. It's going to walk you through a demo of uh, actually using the Notification Hub. Thanks, Todd. Hello, everyone. Um, so today I am going to walk you guys through a simple Windows Store application, and we're going to add push notifications to this uh, application. So we're going to do this uh, from scratch, and we're going to walk through all the different cycles of um, the uh, uh, notification, um, uh, push notification feature uh, that Todd mentioned. So I'm going to start by creating a, a simple Windows Store application. It is a blank application, which will not have any uh, UI elements in it uh, to start with. And uh, it, is, it is empty right now. So we are going to first add a couple of uh, UI um, elements to this application. So these are um, a simple text box and a button. So uh, nothing fancy, a text box and a button. And uh, so I'm going to quickly add the event handler for this button. So this is a very basic working Windows Store application. Um, if I run this application, it does nothing fancy. It just uh, puts up a text box. I can write something in it. I can press a button. But obviously, nothing happens because nothing is hooked up in the button. So now um, what I want to do is I want to uh, add push notification support in this application. And for that, I have to follow a set of uh, configuration steps um, to make that happen. So the first step that I am going to do is I'm going to uh, essentially tell the Windows notification service, the WNS, that my application exists. And then I'm going to associate uh, with that I'm going to do by creating an entry in the Windows Store um, uh, in the Windows Store under my developer's account, and I'm going to associate that entry with my project that I'm developing on this, uh, uh, on this box. So for that, uh, I will just navigate to my uh, developer's account in the Windows Store, Developer Center, and log in using my developer's account. And here, uh, I currently have no applications. Uh, so I'm going to submit a new app, give my app a name, um, tech at notifier. Huh. And I'm going to save this application entry metadata. 
So at this point, my application entry in the Windows Store is ready to be associated with, my, uh, with the project that I'm developing on my box. So I'm going to switch back to my project, and I'm going to go to my Solution Explorer and associate my project to this entry in the App Store. And I have to sign in again to my developer's account. And this should bring up a list of current applications that are available in the store. Um, so here is the one that we just created. And I will click Associate. So this adds a bunch of files that contain the necessary configuration that associates this uh, project with the application in, in Windows Store. So um, the next thing I need to do is I need to enable push notifications in this application itself. So by default, uh, the application is not able to um, receive push notifications because they are disabled. So I'll go to the application manifest, and I'll enable toast notifications, make it toast capable by selecting an option here. So by now, uh, we still have an empty application, but this application actually is a valid Windows Store application. It has been tied to a Windows Store application entry, and uh, push notifications have been enabled for this, uh, for this app. The next step that I need to do is I need to create a notification hub, and I need to tie the notification hub with this, uh, with this application that we just created. And for that, I will switch to, um, I will go to the Windows Azure management portal. And don't make me log in again. Yeah, good. So I will uh, scroll down to service bus. And uh, these are the list of namespaces that I already have. So I'm just going to reuse an existing namespace. And there is a new tab. Um, uh, so th all the entities, so this is the normal. So we have we see queues and topics and relays. But now we also see notification hubs that uh, we can click to manage our notification hubs. So I'm just going to create a new notification hub. And let me just go ahead and do a quick create. I'm going to name it add hub and and there there we go. So now we have a notification hub created uh, in service bus. Uh, now, but this hub is not tied to the um, to my Windows Store app yet. So we need to still make that registration. So for that, I will go to my hub uh, and then conf I'll configure my hub. So in the configuration uh, options. I, uh, we see this uh, Windows notification settings uh, section. So I need to add here the, the package set and the client secret from my Windows Store application uh, that we just uh, created in the previous step. So to get this information, I will jump back to my application. I will click on uh, services, which gives me some data, which uh, will have some metadata about my, um, about my application. And one, piece is, one of the pieces of information that I can get from here is the service side authentication credentials, which can be used by uh, an application backend or notification hub to send push notifications to my application. So I'm just going to paste these service side credentials from my application into my notification hub. Um, configuration here. So packet set goes here. The client secret goes to the client secret. And I'm going to save this. Now, if I had uh, another application that uh, I built for Apple, um, or if I had an Android-based application, I could also configure those applications. I could take the settings for those applications, and I, can, I could put them in the sections beneath this. So Apple, if I had an Apple application, I would put something here, uh, something. So this uh, certificate thumbprint is what we get from, from an uh, Apple application. And I could, my, I could put my Android um, settings here. So this hub could, uh, would, be, um, would be able to send uh, push notifications to either WNS or Android or Google um, uh, or Apple or all of them, depending on what I have configured in this, uh, in this setting in this configuration. 
So at this point, um, so I have created a basic app. I created the Windows Store uh, entry for that app. I created a notification hub in Service Bus, and I configured the notification hub with the credentials uh, to be able to talk to uh, WNS um, so that it could send notifications down to my application instance. Uh, what I don't have is any code. I don't have any code in my application, so I'm just going to add some of that. So when the button is clicked, what I want to happen is I'm just going to borrow some snippet from here. So on pressing of a button, what I want to happen is the first thing is, uh, as Todd mentioned, ap applications go up to window, uh, the WNS. They grab a, uh, they create a channel. They establish a channel with the WNS. What this does is it tells the WNS that this application now is um, running and is ready to accept uh, push notifications. And it also gets us back uh, a thing called a channel. The channel has a property called the channel URI. This channel URI identifies this particular application instance uh, and this particular um, uh, registration of uh, the application instance uh, with WNS. So this channel URI, uh, again, as Todd mentioned, that uh, you could send this channel URI to your application backend, and then your application backend can send WNS-based notifications to your app uh, by talking to WNS directly. But that would have all the problems that he mentioned, that it will be platform specific, it will not scale, you will have to manage your own scale, and all of that. So which is why the client application is going to send the channel URI up to notification hubs. and. The way it does that is by using the Notification Hub API. Um, like Notification Hub, we create a new Notification Hub client, and we pass in the uh, hub name. And I've already pre-configured the, the connection string, which is simply the namespace and the access key and the secret. And uh, finally, uh, we make a call to registered native async, which takes the channel URI, sends it to Notification Hub, and also, optionally, it can send a bunch of an array of uh, string tags. So the tags are, uh, um, are arbitrary strings that the application is free to choose uh, and the application is free to set. And um, these are the tags that uh, are registered along with this device, this device in the notification hub. So when the application backend uh, wants to send a notification to this application, it can select which tags to send this notification to. So if the tag I send up is Contoso, for example, um, then uh, the application backend, if that guy sends the notification to Contoso, it will only uh, come down to the application instances that have registered with a tag called Contoso. So in this particular case, I'm just uh, passing the text box's value as a tag for the registration. And I'm just going to add a new get package so that these references get resolved. So, so now we have a working application. I can run this guy and it will register a Contoso tag, uh, but nothing is going to happen. It, is, it has just started listening for, it just registered with the WNS and it started registering, uh, listening for push notifications coming down for this application. Um, to actually make this uh, more interesting, we have to um, create an application backend that initiates the push notification to be sent, uh, to, be sent to this application instance. So I'm just going to uh, stop this application and I'm going to add a dummy application backend. It will be a simple console application. And I will call it my app backend. And this guy, I will borrow another snippet of code from my notepad. So this uh, is very straightforward. Uh, basically, all that we are doing here is that we're creating a hub client, again, from the connection string for the namespace and with the name of the notification hub. And then we will read from the command line um, uh, the, a, a message to send as a notification. And then we're just going to turn around and send a call, send Windows notification, native uh, notification method on the hub client. 
and I will pass the message uh, inside this fancy XML builder helper class that we provided along with the API. So I'm going to again add a new get package so that the references can be resolved. And currently it is in preview, so I'm going to add the preview uh, new get package. So I'm just I'm now going to run my app backend. Notice that the application is now not running, uh, which is the whole point of push notifications. That all application does not need to be running. The registration is there. So I will start this application, and hopefully I will see a notification pop up. There we go. So uh, this device had registered. Uh, with WNS for this uh, push notification. Application was not running, but um, this uh, push notification still popped up. I could click the push notification, uh, the toast that popped up, and I, it would uh, uh, restart or reopen the application. And then application might consume uh, the push notification data and all. I could here, I could optionally, uh, while sending the notification, I could also specify a tag. I could say Contoso. Um, which means that only send the notification to all the devices that registered a tag which said uh, with Contoso. By default, uh, if I do not specify anything, then it will just broadcast to all the devices on that um, on, on that hub. So, yeah. So that is pretty much pretty much it. Thanks, Afan. So Afan covered the very basic process of setting up the relationships between the push notification service, in this case, the Windows notification service, the client application, and you know, basically how your back-end app wires into that process in order to send a notification. Now, that may have seemed complicated. If you have to do all of that in your own back-end code and do that across multiple platforms, that quickly starts to get uh, to be a heavy load for your app. And what we've just done by that one-time setup is put something in the middle that will offload all the subsequent registration calls that, that are going to happen from your back-end to our service. And that also gives you a single contact point for sending notifications to all of your devices, all of your connected clients, a subset of your connected clients or to individual connected clients. And also gives you that ability in a way that's cross-platform. And I'm going to talk about some of those pieces a little bit more. Now, Afan didn't really focus on some aspects of that. And so I kind of want to, you know, having shown you that as a sort of the basic setup, I want to go through a couple of the features of notification hubs that he touched on, but, but sort of talk a little bit more about, uh, about each one of them. So I, I, I sort of just went through this bit. Um, you don't have to worry about the platform-specific protocols for push. You don't have to store all of the notification, all of the registrations in your own backend. And then you can reach a large audience by sending a single message into a notification hub and having that be fanned out to the entire audience. Again, with a direct interface to the PNS, you would have to send individual messages to every client. So in this case, you send one message to the notification hub, and we fan that out for you. We do the hard work of scaling that up to millions of connected devices. So there was a, a Afan mentioned using a tag, uh, the Contoso tag. I want to drill in a little bit more to, to what that's about and how that works. So tags are a way to do pub sub. If you're familiar with what we do with service bus topics, we have a thing called a filter. And we have a couple of different kinds of filters that you can use. Tags do something very similar for notification hubs. The difference is, is that with a notification hub, the tag is being defined, or at least can be very, very easily defined by the client at the time that the client registers. The client puts up a registration into the notification hub and says, here's my address, here's my channel URL, and here are the tags that indicate what I'm interested in. And that client can express 
interest in a number of different tags or a single tag, a client can register for up to 60 different tags if it wants to as part of that single action of registering. And what those tags do is they say, here are the kinds of messages I'm interested in receiving. So let's take a simple example of a music sharing application where as part of your app logic, you've, you've got some profile information on that, on that user about what bands they like, right? So you've got one person who's interested in the Beatles and one person who's interested in the Whalers. When they register, that registration will carry that tag. Give me Beatles messages, give me Whalers related messages. Then the back end will actually have the ability to send a message and tag that message with properties that indicate which of those audiences that message is destined for. Then the service bus notification hub will determine exactly which clients should receive that message and make sure that only those clients receive that message. You can also use that same mechanism to give individual clients a higher level address in your application, one that is abstracted away from the particular channel URI that that application has at, at, at any given moment. So those channel URIs that Afan was talking about that you have to go and get from the PNS, those change all the time. The PNS can change those channel URIs uh, multiple times a month on you. And that's why the app has to constantly go re-register, because it, it has to know, like, what, what is, what's my address right now, today, at this particular moment? And then as that changes, it has to go tell your back end, oh, this is where I am now. So that is something that you can easily abstract away using these tags by giving every instance of your application a unique ID in the form of a tag. You could also do that in a way that allows you to create an abstraction across a user and all of that user's devices. So you may have an ID for a particular customer, and that customer may have three different types of devices. They may have a tablet, uh, they may have an, um, uh, an iPhone, they may have a Surface. Now you have a single ID for that user, and that, I that user's apps are going to all log in and give you registrations that have that ID on it. So now you can send a message with that tag, and you will get messages, push notifications sent to all of that user's devices and apps. So that's something to think about in terms of how you can use PubSub for addressing. Another thing that we do that I think is really interesting, I haven't seen this anywhere else. I'd love to hear if uh, any of you guys out there have seen any other platforms offering something like this. I think we're the only ones. Is that we have a concept of a template. So when a customer uh, or when a, when a client registers to receive notifications, it can provide not only tags, but it can provide a platform-specific template for how it wants any messages that it receives to be mapped into its own native UI vocabulary. So Bob has a surface, and he registers to the notification hub using a Windows Store template that looks something like this. And what he's basically saying here, if you see the dollar sign message, he's saying there's a property on this message that I'm going to get. And when that property comes through, here's how I want it to be displayed. I want it to be displayed as part of a text box, or a text, in this case, it's a text toast. He could have done anything that's available in the Windows client UI vocabulary for expressing how you display values in a notification. There's a whole rich, uh, uh, there's a whole rich set of capabilities here for defining UI that's, that's actually part of the Windows Phone um, and, and Windows 8 um, client uh, APIs. This is not something that we've invented with uh, the service bus notification hubs. What we've invented is that our client knows how to recognize dollar sign message and knows how to do the mapping of that value coming in on that message into the UI that you've created. Okay? Now Alice has an iPhone, and she registers with an Apple template. Here, something much simpler, basically saying, give me an alert. Your back end sends a single platform independent message with a property message and a value hello. 
both of those clients are going to receive that message and that will be mapped appropriately. It's a very simple example, but you can imagine much more complex examples. <clears throat> so in a sense, this is like mass customization. <clears throat> you can send a single stream of messages into a notification hub, and we will handle the customization of how those messages are displayed out at the edge as those messages are delivered to individual, uh, individual client instances. So that's templates, and it's something that enables multi-platform in a fundamental way that is not possible with other, um, other services today. We also support native, so you don't have to use templates. You can actually do all of this um, uh, UI setup on the server side if you want to and push the whole load down so you can control the UI experience from the service side. Sometimes that's, that's the desired behavior, but you do have this other option. So I'll talk a little bit about scale. So I talked about how registration traffic is actually one of the primary cost drivers for us running the service, and for, for, as a result, for any of you who are trying to build something like this yourselves today. Um, today, we're in preview. We're not yet generally available. I mentioned that. We're going to go generally available uh, this summer. While we're in preview, there are a couple of limitations. We have a limit of, of 10,000 registrations, uh, simultaneous registrations per hub during preview. If you need more and you want to play with a larger scale, you can just contact us, send a mail to uh, support, and we can up that for you. When we go GA, we will recommend that customers not create multiple notification hubs and shard their traffic across them. The whole point of the notification hub is to make it so that you don't have to worry about scale. However, there is a, a, a level of scale at which you might want to consider doing something like that. If you're in the millions, I would say if you're above, say, 5 million, something in that order, that's when you might need to start thinking about having multiple notification hubs. We're, we're, we're sort of tracking to supporting device or client communities on the order of a few millions at this point. Throughput and latency considerations. Um, our uh, stated goal with the notification hubs is to be able to deliver all of the, the notifications to all, all uh, addressable or connected clients within a couple of minutes. So this is not a low latency delivery channel, but to be clear, that's not anything that we can directly control from the point of view of the notification hub. The bulk of the latency comes from the push notification services that we are pushing to, and those services are not low latency services. So. In general, um, you can expect to deliver all of your notifications within a couple of minutes, having sent that message to the uh, notification hub. Having multiple notification hubs won't give you any faster, uh, any more throughput, uh, or a better performance. So I want to talk about the limitations of the push notification services uh, in general. So this isn't. This is about understanding where it makes sense to use push notifications and where some other kind of messaging infrastructure is required. Sometimes people will come uh, to us and say, uh, I really like this push notification hub, uh, this notification hub thing. Uh, can I use that for my stock ticker inside of my, uh, my mobile app? We say, probably not. It's not well suited for that. And there are other scenarios that it's not well suited for. So I want to kind of take a minute to sort of tease out some of the limitations of the PNS infrastructure that's out there. These are not just limitations of our notification hub. These are limitations of push notifications in the way that they're actually implemented today by the OS vendors. Uh, so first, it's important to understand what the PNS's purpose in life is. Why do the OS vendors build and maintain this infrastructure? Why are they doing it? Typically, they're not charging for it. It's free. You, you would have to pay us to use the notification hub. But the push notification infrastructure is, is free of charge. Why do the OS vendors do this? Well, they are offering effectively an OS managed channel into every instance of their operating system. The goal is to provide a single shared, always on connection for every device. The last mile problem is to use a telco term. I'm going to, as an OS vendor, I'm going to give my developer community a channel that I'm going to maintain that they can all multiplex their traffic over. And I'm going to hold that channel open, and I'm going to take the cost of all the infrastructure necessary to hold on to several million sockets 
which is not a trivial exercise. That's what the OS vendors are effectively doing. That will let me ensure that my customers can build apps that conserve the power on my device. So, uh, you know, Apple doesn't want the iPhone to be such a power hog, you know, that, that, that basically it gets really bad reviews from its users. So, so they are doing this in order to make it easier for developers to manage the power resources and provide a good battery life experience. They're also doing it to reduce the demand on server resources for applications that are being written to their platform. So they're basically giving that one away as a freebie. There's also another key thing, which is, is that with mobile operating systems, there's an execution model that is somewhat different from what we're used to with regular, uh, with regular thick client or with regular uh, operating systems. So for the mobile operating systems. And increasingly, so we see this already with Windows 8, there's this tombstoning notion, which is that you can run background processes, but it's very hard to do. And in some cases, you can't even run background processes. When you're not in the app, the app is tombstoned. So there's an execution model now that requires a, a way to go wake up the user and say, hey, there's something, I've got some news for you. Some process has finished. You should go open this app and let me finish that process and show you what I've got. Right? There's, a, there's an almost an interactive process now where you've kind of got to, you've sort of got to wake up the user to get, to get the application model to really work the way it should. So there's, a, there's an execution model that they're trying to provide support for here that's different than what we've been used to. Now, they're not always uh, suitable for in-app scenarios. Now, under, having understood this background and why the OS vendors are doing it, you might understand that delivery here is best effort. The types of scenarios that are being supported are all over the map, and they're, they're generally fairly basic scenarios. So delivery is best effort. Performance is best effort. You get what you pay for. There are message size limitations. And today, there's a fairly exclusive focus on smartphones and tablets. So you wouldn't use the PNSs to talk to a uh, a custom uh, special purpose device in most cases. The one exception is the Google Cloud messaging platform, which covers Android and Chrome. But it does have these other uh, limitations. And if you want to do a multi-platform application, then you have a challenge there. So the push notification systems are not a solution for all of your messaging problems with connected client. That's the main point I wanted to make on this slide. If you want guarantees about having a message delivered, if you want to deal with large messages, if you have an application that requires higher throughput, you need something else. So that was user engagement. And now what I want to talk about is another set of challenges, and we're going to kind of move beyond just thinking about the PNS approach. We're going to start looking at what you can do with the service bus and other technologies that, uh, that we have uh, to offer um, to solve some of the other, the other common challenges. So location transparency and addressability. Uh, there are a couple approaches to doing this. So the, the challenge here is fundamentally, how do I send a message to my devices? My devices are scattered all over the world. Some of them are mobile. How do I, how do I even address that thing? It could be located behind firewalls and NATs that I don't control. This is what I mean by location transparency and addressability. And one approach that we see, particularly in the um, embedded device space, special purpose device space, is VPNs. I think there's just a sort of a natural tendency for people to say, well, I want to address my device, what do I do? I, I got to give it an IP address. Isn't that the way? <laughs> sure. Okay, so let's go get a VPN out there and make sure that every one of those devices out in the field that I might need to, uh, to communicate with is joined to my network. Give every device a virtual IP address join those devices into a single virtual network with my service side VMs. So that's kind of a layer three strategy. There's some downsides to this. You've now got a single network where all of these devices out there in the field are on the same network with your services. That opens up a number of attack vectors that you need to think about. Do you actually want uh, 
a piece of software running in a, a delivery vehicle or a piece of embedded code running in, a del in the delivery vehicle to be able to access your services. Well, what if, what if somebody gets a hold of that box and reverse engineers it and basically has access to your services now? What about client-to-client -client access? How do you keep one client from accessing another client? So there's a set of things about isolating clients in a scenario like this that become challenging. Now, those things can all be solved, but it's a bit of rocket science to do that at the network layer and also at scale, potentially millions of devices. If you think about what's really needed, you don't really need network layer connectivity. You don't need to join these devices into a single network in order to achieve the goal. What you really need is to let that device or that client access specific application endpoints that it needs to know about and interact with in order to get and use and consume the backing services that it needs. It doesn't need arbitrary network access. Typically, it needs fairly limited and known access. So that's one of the reasons why a network layer solution may not be your best choice from a security perspective. So I've already talked about how difficult that is to solve with the network layer. So there's another approach, another common approach, which is what I'm calling the socket listener approach. So instead of giving every device an IP address, Let's give every device a socket. And again, I'm, using, I'm starting to use the term device here. I want to make clear this is the same concept as what I was talking about under the PNS heading as a channel. Typically, you're going to have one of these sockets per device. You can have more than one um, logical connection within that socket. So you can have an application that has multiple channels registered to receive push notifications. And in the same way, when you have a socket listener, you can have multiple virtual uh, connections over it. But now I'm talking about that single socket, that thing that the PNS systems are trying to do. You can effectively mimic that same approach and give every one of your devices a socket. How do you do that? Well, you use technologies that have been developed in the real-time web space for doing that. This is kind of where a lot of this stuff has come from. Uh, with Service Bus, we have another approach that is very similar um, and that we were working on well before there was such a thing as WebSockets. But today, in the real-time web arena, we have a broad adoption of WebSockets specifically to address this type of scenario. Starting out with uh, web clients, but now being used for other applications as well, such as connected clients broadly, like I was uh, describing at the beginning, mobile clients and uh, uh, Internet of Things scenarios. Two technologies that we have uh, support for in the platform. One is uh, Socket.io, which is a, a node framework for, uh, for uh, real-time web messaging. And then something called SignalR, which is a uh, Microsoft homegrown project that basically gives you a, uh, a C-sharp um, uh, experience uh, and a set of abstractions that are really quite powerful in some ways go beyond what Socket.io can do um, to provide this sort of socket per device. And then there's some messaging abstractions on top of that. that I, I'm not going to touch on this in great, I'm not going to go into great detail about how these things work. Um, but just to point out that these things are applied to mobile client scenarios as well as browser-based scenarios now. So increasingly, we're seeing these used for mobile apps. I've already talked about WebSockets. This is very similar, I'll point out, to what we have with the Service Bus Relay. The difference is, is that with Socket.io and SignalR, what you're getting is a low-level socket. You're not getting sort of the higher-level uh, service integration that we provide with the Relay. The relay really isn't meant for these types of device scenarios. The relay is meant for enterprise services and projecting those out into the cloud, but it's doing the same thing. And in fact, we invented a protocol for that several years ago, which we called WebSockets before WebSockets existed. And then we had to change the name. We now call it WebStreams. Virtually the same thing under the hood. So one of the benefits of the socket listener approach is that since you're not persisting the message, Remember how I talked about the difference between relay and broker up front and, and how you don't get the kind of the, the, the persistence benefits of uh, messaging with the relay. 
same thing tr is true here. And that gives you the advantage that you can implement um, lower latency scenarios than you can with, with a buffered or, or a persistent messaging approach. So that's why these technologies are really optimized for things like real-time web. But there are some limitations. When you have no persistence of these messages in flight, messages can be lost. In order to avoid that scenario uh, where messages are going to be lost, you need to have um, you need to have a durable messaging infrastructure. And really, that if you need message delivery guarantees, the socket listener approach is not going to be sufficient for you. But there are some things that you can do that will address some of the limitations. In particular, if you want to scale out a socket farm and you want to have failover for a socket farm, you need a, a backplane that lets you effectively connect the various different socket farms together so that you can scale them out and each of the connected clients can then message one another. Or if you send a message into this infrastructure, it will appropriately be delivered to all of, this, all of, the, uh, all of the nodes that need it across the various different instances that you have. That problem is something that we can solve with a backplane. And I'm going to talk about how Service Bus can be that backplane for Socket IO and SignalR. So here is a, uh, let's imagine you've got an IIS server. And that IIS server is running SignalR, or it's running some, uh, some node code with Socket IO. And you think, well, I'd probably better have some redundancy here. If that thing goes down, I'm going to lose all of my connected clients. Uh, so I'll have two of them. But then there's also the scale issue. If you have more than a few tens of thousands of connected clients, you're going to need more than one uh, server. So let's say you double that. So now I've got four servers running my messaging backend. What happens when clients come in and connect to those servers? Each one of those clients is going to be holding a socket to a single node, randomly assigned. It'll be, it'll be assigned by a load balancer. What happens if a client in group one wants to publish a message, say a chat message, and say hello to a client that's in group two? How does that work? It doesn't. You need something else. You need a backplane. Similarly, if one of these nodes goes down, you want those clients to be rebalanced onto the other nodes. And regardless of where they land, you still want them to be addressable by all of the other clients and by your backend code. So here's where Service Bus comes in. You can use Service Bus topics as a scale out backplane for a SignalR or Socket IO farm. And effectively, what you're doing with that is you're using a service bus topic to publish messages across all of the nodes so that all messages sent to any of the nodes are available to all clients on any of the nodes. There will be a slight latency hit for that, but that gives you uh, failover and it gives you scale. There's a lot of material on this. Uh, I'm not going to go through this in detail. But if you'd like to learn more, there are a couple of GitHub repositories I'd suggest you check out, as well as a, a, a few different articles that have been written describing how you can use service bus topics in this way. Um, the folks behind SignalR have done a really good job of making that so easy that it's really just a matter of configuration. They'll even, they've even got the, the framework code that goes out and creates the topic and wires it up for you. So it's very, very simple to do this. All right, there's a third approach. And I'm calling that the brokered messaging approach. So we had the VPN approach, give every client an IP address. We had the socket listener approach, hold a socket for every client. And now we have the brokered messaging approach. And that one I would summarize as saying, give every client a message queue in the cloud. Another way to think about that is give every client an inbox, or an inbox and an outbox, depending on whether you need one-way or two-way messaging. This supports a set of advanced messaging patterns that only come when you have mediation, when you have something that mediates or sits between or allows decoupling between the components of your application. Once you've got that, then you can do a set of things that typically are, are seen in enterprise scenarios. Temporal decoupling. So when the client goes offline, 
you can still deliver messages to that client. That client won't get them immediately, but as soon as the client logs back in again and checks its queue or its inbox, it'll get the message. So that's, that's temporal decoupling. The application is decoupled in time. And delivery guarantees. So if a client is connected but has some issue with processing a message and doesn't complete it, then that message can easily be returned to the queue without the client having to do anything. And there's a process called peak lock, uh, which is a way to read a message. And basically, you only delete that message from the queue when you confirm that you've, you're done with it. That methodology is a common enterprise pattern that we support with queues and pub sub topics. And uh, you have the advantage of using that type of pattern when you have a brokered messaging approach. Uh, advanced flow control, uh, batching, uh, TTL on messages, scheduling, and then things like session state, uh, which allow you to implement multi-step processing scenarios. So imagine you're doing a firmware update that has several steps to it. You want to be able to know that you've completed each step along the way. You can store the state of where you are in processing those messages in the session state on the service bus. It also has built-in firewall and NAT traversal capabilities, so it gives you the full location transparency. I'm going to have to speed through some of the final uh, points here, because I see we're running out of time. So queues can be used for uh, providing addressability. In this case, you would provide a queue per client. And, they, and that queue represents the inbox of each client. Uh, you can support up to 2,000 messages per second and up to 5 gigabytes of buffer. Can somebody tell me, are we really out of time? Is it at the end? OK. I, I, I can't believe the clock. Sorry. Um, so there's dedicated capacity, basically, in each queue. There's a limit of 10,000 queues per namespace. We can provision more if you need them. Uh, there's another way to do it without using queues, and that is using, using topics and subscriptions. Queues enable an inbox per client. In this case, you'll create a topic, and the inboxes will be subscriptions on that topic. And those subscriptions ex exactly mimic the behavior of a queue. The difference is that you can set filters on the subscriptions, and then let the topic manage the delivery of those messages. So those rules will be applied, and the messages will go to the subscriptions according to the, uh, the filters. So it's very similar to what we saw with the PNS, uh, with uh, push notification hubs and um, uh, tags. So you can achieve both targeted and group delivery this way. Uh, I'm going to skip the review of filters. I already mentioned a little bit that we have a rich filtering model. There's a couple of different kinds of filters that you can use. You can apply a great many of them. The limitations of the basic method, you can only connect 2,000 subscriptions to a topic. And unlike queues, subscriptions don't have dedicated resources. You're sharing a single 5 gigabyte uh, store for all of your messages that are in flight when you're using a topic. So one, you, one thing you can do is create a, top, a topic hierarchy. We have a feature called Auto Forward. What you do is you wire up a topic subscription to another topic, and you create a layered approach. So in this case, I've shown uh, a case where you're just creating a single layered hierarchy between a distribution topic, which is going to then forward every message it gets to all of the uh, end topics. And then you can have your clients connected up here. Since you support 2,000 clients subscriptions per topic, this will scale uh, theoretically to 4 million connected clients. Depending upon the throughput that you want, you might want to tone that down to no more than 1,000 messages, 1,000 uh, subscriptions per topic. That'll give you roughly one message per second on average. Uh, I'm going to skip how you use auto forward. It's very, very simple. Lastly, you can combine these approaches. So if you wanted dedicated resources, which you don't get with topics, you can forward from a subscription into a queue, and each customer inbox will effectively be capable of storing up to five gigabytes of data. All right. Um, client platform diversity, just really quick. We have a lot of client platform coverage with service bus queues and topics. The recent addition of AMQP support gives us much broader reach, including to C, C Sharp, uh, C, C++, and Java JMS. Um, C is particularly useful for the embedded client scenarios. You can see here that we're supporting a variety of platforms on SignalR. We also have HTTP APIs for everything. I'm going to have to skip the auth model subject, unfortunately, and it's too bad because it was actually my favorite subject. So uh, if, you want, if you want to talk afterwards, if you have questions about uh, auth model options, the, the main thing I wanted to explain is that we have a new auth model that we support called shared access, access signatures. 
Clemens is going to demo it tomorrow. Great. So shared access signatures is a complementary model, or not a complementary, but an alternative model to using access control service. If you've used access control service, you already know that that supports ID federation. Shared access signatures is in some ways a much simpler model. It gives you direct control over things like setting token expiry. And there's a bunch of benefits for that for certain client connected, connected client scenarios. Um, you'll have advantage of the deck. Uh, it's all fairly self-explanatory. So uh, thank you for listening. and. Uh, Appreciate your attention today. <laughs>